Hi, everyone. This is Gwen Sandifer with Loud Minds, and I'm honored to be with Pam Reese today. So I'll let Pam introduce herself in a moment. But this is a very exciting time. This is March, and March is known as Women's History Month. And then March 8th is actually known as International Women's Day. And Pam and I have been talking. We're, we're now not only former colleagues and current friends, but we're both coaches and we both have a good coaching base, mostly women. And there are a lot of topics coming up. So first I'll turn it over to Pam to introduce herself more thoroughly and then acknowledge she's been doing a lot of research and has some good articles, which she'd like to uh, put forth today. And then we'll have some good dialogue about what does this mean to us, if anything? Have we experienced any of this ourselves? And then finally, what other resources uh, might we be able to offer to all of you who might uh, be facing similar situations? So Pam? Yes, hi everyone and thank you, Gwen. Um, it's an honor to be with all of you and be able to share some of our thoughts. Um, we have an opportunity now with our coaching practices to not only learn uh, what others are struggling with, with our, our clients, but also be more reflective and objective uh, in terms of what we have encountered um, throughout our careers. And we just wanted to share some of that with you and then also encourage you. Uh, so we'll have a few tips as well as to what we can maybe do to keep making progress. Okay, great. So Pam, what are some of those articles or or high points um, from those articles that you um, were able to forward to me last week? Yeah, so uh, one of the articles is really about women who are held back at work due to many biases. So we often think about gender bias, and in particular, with a month like this, when we're celebrating women, um, the progress that's been made, but quite frankly, since the 80s, uh, the statistics have not changed dramatically. And so while women were making good progress in the 70s and 80s, uh, relatively speaking, we haven't seen a lot of progress since. And what was intriguing to me is, of course, we think about the gender biases and discrimination that we're dealing with, but add on top of that other characteristics that women are potentially discriminated against uh, for and that was eye-opening for me and as I thought back and reflected on that list way too many of them actually applied to me um, so things like you know your accent your age your whether you're attractive um, body size obviously um, racial um, culture and your uh, marital status, I mean, all kind, even parental status can come into play for women. And that was very enlightening for me. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard Michigan's actually the only state in the union that has said it is discrimination uh, when we're discussing body size or viewing body size inappropriately. So, wow. <laughs> the only state in the nation? The only state in the nation. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Yeah. And, you know, I remember uh, one time earlier in my career when I was interviewing someone um, to be a receptionist, I was interviewing for a receptionist for an office and uh, the person who was hiring, I shared with them who the most qualified person was. And they said, oh, was that the overweight one? <gasps> I don't want, I don't want that person in the front of my office. And I was just appalled, yeah. but yeah. that came out way too easy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sure did. Yes. Yeah. And we've both had varied careers, uh, many different organizations, companies, different roles. Um, so any 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 other personal stories um, that you've mm -hmm. experienced either as an HR leader or other kind of, of role or just your, you yourself? Yeah, well, of course, as an HR leader, I have many, <laughs> many stories. Sure. some of which should not be shared, um, but I'll, I'll keep it as general as I can. And I, I think, unfortunately, there I see, I saw a lot of discrimination coming out in the hiring process and even in promotions. And sometimes it came down to, I want to promote this woman, 
but I don't want to give her that full promotional increase, mm. monetary increase. And so I would often ask the question, if it were a man that you were promoting, would you feel the same way? Mm -hmm. And so that often, I usually could counsel them differently, um, the hiring manager, but that often surprised me. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see the same when a, a male was getting promoted. I, I would see, you know, readily give them the increase that they were qualified for, for that position. Mm -hmm. And was there a response? Why a lesser increase for the female? It was always, well, I'm not sure they're fully up to it. Um, yeah, they're qualified, but they haven't had the same level of experience or something was always pushing the woman down um, in terms of they're not quite ready. Not quite ready or not quite fully committed. Um, I know there's always a question of childbearing age. Yes. Do they have children? Are they thinking about having children? Just this constant, they yeah. may they might get swept away and <laughs> focus on something besides work. Exactly. And I myself was in an interview uh, where um, I was of childbearing age. I had had one child. And um, first of all, my interview was a group of men. Uh. with the panel, And it was in a country club that was male <laughs> dominated <laughs> um, for lunch. And um, I was getting drilled with questions and, you know, trying to be as at ease as I could in that situation. And then one of them said, well, you're still young. Aren't you going to have more babies? Mm. <laughs> and <laughs> that was offensive to me on so many fronts. Um, but yeah, to even, you know, ask that question, that's not going to be a question you're going to ask a man. And first of all, it's illegal. Uh, but, but why, why do we need to ask that question? And then I've known other women who have chosen not to have children or were not able to have children and they were expected to work doubly hard because they were more available per se. Yes. yes. They didn't have these other commitments. Correct. And yet men generally have daycare built into their family. So they don't have these other commitments as much either, which Perfect. isn't fair to the man in the relationship no. by those assumptions. No. And actually another article I was reading was about a study that was done where uh, the assumption by the employer was that they couldn't promote women to the top ranks in leadership or partnership because they did have these other commitments. And so they were thought they were doing a good thing and really pushing all these accommodations towards women. Mm -hmm. And so they brought in a firm and said, you know, you help us fix this. We want to better understand, it. is there something in our culture? Well, what are we doing? And um, so the study proceeded um, by the consulting firm and they found as they interviewed both men and women that men felt the same commitment level, but didn't take the accommodations or felt that there was no way um, as a man that they could speak up and say, I can't take that trip this month, or um, I can't travel every single night of the week, or I can't work those 20 extra hours that you're expecting. And, um, and the firm just assumed that this was all about women. So when the consulting um, firm came forward and said, here's what we found, it's actually your culture is working people too hard and expecting them to be available 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And it's affecting both men and women. And the employer rejected that theory <sighs> and said, and fired the consultant and said, that can't be the problem. Yes. So, you know, for, for men as well, you know, we talk a lot too about men can be allies for women. And I think women need to be allies for men. We need both men and women in the workplace. It's an important part of diversity that we need to acknowledge and appreciate. We both have great things to offer 
and oftentimes can offset um, each other in different ways. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, need, the necessity for us to really lift each other up versus tear each other down is a big lesson in helping us make progress towards making sure that people are getting acknowledged and have the, their needs met while they're working. Because most people are working because they need the income, but also because they've found a passion um, that they're interested in and they're pursuing. Exactly. Exactly. And and I think it's important to say here that Pam and I have always identified as women. Um, It's called Women's History Month. And yet uh, there might be people that don't identify necessarily as a woman or as a man, they may be general neutral. And so that's part of this conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Historically, uh, there's been a lot of gender norm and then bias based on that gender norm. And now we're in a whole new milieu of, you know, gender diversity and gender identification. And so as we discuss this topic, we're really relying on historical perspective Um, but we want to be very inclusive, even in this conversation and acknowledge that, that we don't have all the information. We don't understand, um, all the different perspectives personally, and none of this conversation is intended to offend anyone or, or limit, uh, the conversation to exclude, um, any gender or or any gender identification, um, And yet it's important as we talk about bias and people do make assumptions about each of us based upon how we look, how we show up, what our name is. Um, I know you've seen in resumes people um, be uh, biased just based on the name at the top of a resume, um, not even getting into the personal interviews. Um, That's tough. It's, It's tough to work through. And I don't think I'll ever forget when Time's Up uh, came out just you know, a few years ago and it was really, really raising up in Hollywood. Um, some of the research indicated that the number two industry of male dominance and ma- male gender bias right behind Hollywood was healthcare. Wow. And I, I had to go, really? Because I've always grown up in healthcare as an industry. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I thought, of course. You know, go back and look at the history of medicine. Yes, there were women healers. Yes, there were many sisters involved in the Catholic charities of starting up clinics and starting up hospitals. And yet, as soon as money got involved in the 60s and Medicare and Medicaid really started to make healthcare big business, you know, the men took over and the Doctors became physicians, the men became physicians, and um, it it really sidelined the women, relegated many women to the nursing profession or some sort of assistant to the doctor profession. Uh, So I I experienced a, a lot of that bias myself, just even when I talk about becoming, coming from a healthcare background, the assumption is, oh, so you were, were you a nurse? Yes. No, I I was on the business side. Um, And for women, there's a lot of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Pardon my language. Uh, I remember being a young female and being treated like a young girl. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, coming to work in a healthcare organization that happened to be Catholic with a sister on the board. And every time I would walk by her, she would whisper something. And finally I asked an assistant, what Mm -hmm. is she whispering? And she said, oh, she's calling you a clothes horse. She thinks you're too, too focused on how you look in the role rather than the role itself. And I Hmm. thought, interesting. So then I started to change and and, and I guess I'd also heard from some of the doctors that we were recruiting for employment, the suits, the suits are here, the suits are here. Um, and so again, I was young enough. I thought, okay, well, I will not wear a suit when I go meet with a physician. 
I'll wear a suit when I'm in a board meeting or a high level executive meeting, but I'll really shift, you know, what I wear based on the audience. And then later on, I heard, you know, you're really great from the board and you, I know you're in a succession plan, but you, you don't dress like an executive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, ah, you know, what do you do? Absolutely. You know, I was thinking of, um, after reading these articles, but also Gwen and I are both reading a book that she'll tell you about in a few minutes, but I was thinking about that book, even as I was getting dressed this morning, and I was thinking, you know what, I'm not going to wear a suit. I, I'm i most comfortable dressing in a feminine way. Uh, that just is who I am, and it feels so good to be able to express yourself for who you really are. Obviously, we have roles to play when we're in professional organizations and need to dress for certain things like board meetings. But I think it's something that probably men wouldn't think about if they're going to meet with a physician. You know, I want to dress in a way that I'm more relatable mm -hmm. to them. And, uh, and I think that's a quality that women bring often um, that maybe men are not always able to bring. So I applaud you <laughs> for thinking that way. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you too, um, do you recall being in situations where women weren't supporting other women? Mm, besides, yeah. besides the example you just gave us. Yes. In fact, I've thought a lot about this and um, most of my best bosses and colleagues were men who mm -hmm. were confident in their career, confident in their leadership. And so they really were great allies. Mm -hmm. The absolute worst situation I had was starting in a new role um, many years ago. And I'd gone through the interview process and just landed the job and got, got invited to a meeting with two women who were going to be my colleagues. And I didn't know what the meeting was about. I thought it was a meet and greet and starting the new role. <clears throat> and come to find out, uh, one woman uh, was very, very businesslike. And she said, I'm here to tell you that this other woman applied for this job. She's internal. She has a long history of success here. And we want to know why the hell you think you're qualified for this position and why did they hire you instead? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's horrible. <clears throat> so what did you say? Rallied myself and said, I can't speak to I, you know, why I was hired, but I can speak to my background and my my desire and my passion for this work. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about any details of my background or any gaps because sure, I, I have a lot to learn, but you know, here's, here's what I hope to do and here are the competencies I do bring. Um, and I hope to work with both of you, you know, very well and, and make this a team to be able to move forward. Um, she didn't really buy it. <laughs> oh dear. Um, it got better than it probably would have if I just gotten angry and walked out the door. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, it was a tough situation. Absolutely. But women can be catty, 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 catty and hurtful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think it, it is a back, back about just culture in mm -hmm. medicine or even in tech. Tech is a male dominated industry. It's so competitive and men are known for competition. Mm -hmm. But it seems like men also like to stir up the women and watch the cat fight. Yes, which is very disappointing because women already have a lot of challenges. Uh, I think I mean, I've experienced that that um, a, a man can work extra hard to manipulate behind the scenes and sabotage relationships even. Um, and some of that may come from jealousy. Some of that may come from, you know, jealousy of the relationship of the women, but then also the success of the women. 
-hmm. I think a lot of it does stem from, you know, I don't want to see these women elevated in the way that they are because of the thousands of years of history where uh, women have not been elevated in the way that they should have been. Mm -hmm. So I think that plays a, a big role in it, but nevertheless, it's not right. We should all be striving to support one another, encourage one another, celebrate each other's successes as much as we should celebrate our own mm -hmm. and uh, recognize that we're going to have differences that actually bring value. <laughs> and that's so important when you think about the consumers in healthcare or any other industry, women are big decision makers when it comes to uh, making a decision about purchasing. And they do often much of the research. And I know that's very true in healthcare and I'm sure it is in other industries as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're smart, all of us, we will recognize that those gender differences do bring value to the end result we're all trying to achieve. Right, right. I, I think a lot of it has to do with assumptions and I could have done even more in that moment in particular and in many moments since of just pausing and asking, you know, what, what are you assuming? What, what, what's really bothering you here? Um, and if it were, of course she didn't get the job, the other person, but mm -hmm. if, if the concern were her opinions wouldn't be heard about this particular role that I now had oversight of, you know, how could I ensure that I was reaching out to her and involving her in projects or in project plans and just mm -hmm. start that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I don't know if some of this catty stuff from women comes because the women historically in career that were successful acted like men. <clears throat> so they had to act competitive mm -hmm. to get to the top. And so that, that just bled over. Um, or if, if we just do see the lack at the top and the lack of women leaders and assume when that one hole is plugged by that one woman, there's no room for anyone else. Or, or if it's a combination right. of both. Right. I think it definitely could be a combination of both. And I was also reading that when women take on qualities that are more prone to men, like assertiveness, uh, they are judged. Yes. When, when men take on qualities that are more prone to women, such as maybe a little bit more empathetic or nurturing, it gives them all kinds of accolades <laughs> because, you know, they're, they're stretching, they're, you know, showing a different side of themselves. And so, and that's happening. I've seen that happen. Yeah. And so that's, you know, we have to all remember, we have these unconscious biases and always be aware of how we're thinking and what we're saying and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're taking an action that uh, is, for a woman, could we ask ourselves, would we take the same action if it were a man? Yes. Yes. And ask ourselves, not even action, but how I feel about this woman doing this thing. Yes. Whether she's up giving a speech or whether she's interviewing or just going about her role. If there's something in us that goes, ew. Yes. Um, ask ourselves, would we feel that same ooh if that were a man mm -hmm. doing that thing or asking that question or making that speech? And that really does get a little bit into assumption, but also the essence of the book. So the, the book that we uh, started to read is called On Our Best Behavior, and it links on our best behavior as women or girls to the seven deadly sins and it's by Elise Lonin. So I'd love for people to check it out, see what they think. Um, for me, it's at minimum thought provoking. Um, but I really do now see how the assumptions we make and, and some of this bias that all of us have against women in leadership comes from culture. 
comes from thousands and thousands of years of culture. And as you just said, culture has males be mostly competitive, mostly mm -hmm. organized, mostly direct and clear and leader, leader-like. Whereas culture would say women are to be caring and compassionate. We're the we're the nourishers, we're, we're the caregivers to the children and, and the other women in the tribe. Um, and so when we come into a situation and try to act like a leader or act or be direct or take up the mantle, um, it's just counterintuitive with the culture that we have all grown up to expect. And we may not all be in leadership, but we all have a mom. And many of us do have children or nieces or nephews. And so we can get a sense of what it's like to be around children. And they look to us most of the time to be that caring, compassionate person that gives them hugs and makes them feel better. And so when we put on that other hat, it, it doesn't feel right. And that's what's coming up that we're resisting or don't like. Yes, absolutely. And the reality is we can love both of those <laughs> sides of us mm -hmm. and do very well mm -hmm. at both of them. Yes, yes. As you said, the men that are able to do both flourish mm -hmm. and women can too. Mm -hmm. It seems though that we have to take a lot more formal, um, proactive action to discuss it rather than just dive in. Um, and so again, back to assumptions, I think I would have done better all along the way if I, at the beginning of a new role or even just, you know, when I was needing to move from my caregiver, compassionate cheerleader role in a, in a leader position into more of the hard ass direct, I hear you all, but this has got to be done mm -hmm. to say those things, you know, I'm going to have to put a different hat on right now. I'm going to have to be much more direct, mm -hmm. or I'm going to have to delegate that component of this project to somebody on this team. Mm -hmm. I need somebody on this team to step up to be the accountability leader. Um, and so sometimes it's about dialoguing and discussing it and put, just putting it out there. I agree, putting it out there. I'm even thinking of when you and I were working together, um, you know, the, the, um, the telephone game <laughs> is often happening when you're in a big organization and, you know, there's so much to accomplish and everybody's working so hard. You know, if we could have, would have taken time to just talk about, you know, we're in this role, we're trying to accomplish certain things, we may be perceived a certain way, how are you feeling about it? You know, I think women, now that I'm able to not be in the thick of it, I think women can do such a better job of supporting one another and lifting each other up. Uh, they're going to do it best, even with men as allies. Uh, women recognizing other women and really supporting them and encouraging them is so powerful. Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, leadership itself is so lonely. It is. <laughs> the higher you rise in leadership, it just gets lonely, lo yeah. lonelier, more lonely. And we are all about connection, mm -hmm. not just as women, but the human race. We mm -hmm. are about connection. And so it's important to be intentional about that. It's important to talk about that. And I think when you talk about it, uh, another lesson I learned was do it discreetly, do it in a one-on-one, -on -one. ask somebody to breakfast or lunch or happy hour or dinner and say, you know, I really want to build a better relationship with you. I think we can work better together if we know each other more. We can build trust. Um, I have to believe we want the same things. We're working right. for the same organization, and and just let them try. You know, let them talk. Yes, I agree. And I and I have clients that 
even today are struggling um, with some of this. And that's what we talk about. You know, what, what can we do to put ourselves in their shoes? Obviously, we're all struggling in different ways. And so what can we do to just have one-on-one -on -one conversation and get real with one another? Mm -hmm. And, you know, talk about the real things that, that matter to us and that we're all, you know, really one team working towards some common goals and that the relationships we have with one another matter in order for us to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much time spent ruminating and in some cases manipulating and <laughs> trying to work through all of that. And it just sucks the joy out of our job um, out of the work that we're passionate about. And then it also sabotages our time. It just takes way too much time and energy. Agree. Agree. Whether it's women that like to watch the cat fight, men that like to do, or women, it, it's just a distraction. And it's a way for those to say, see, told you so, you know, mm -hmm. we shouldn't have hired that young woman, or we shouldn't have hired mm -hmm. that woman. Um, just don't fall for it. Don't get mm -hmm. caught up in the games. Mm -hmm. Speak, be proactive, um, and and put yourself in the other shoes from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, how are you truly being viewed? Do you think? And do you maybe need to shift or, or tweak a little bit about what you're doing, how you show up, how you appear? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it could be valid feedback. Absolutely. So Pam, given all this, do you have any final thoughts or a summary for those that view this? Yes, I think, you know, with all the stories and all the research and everything that's done, what we can agree on is that the struggle is real um, when we talk about gender biases and add many other biases on top of that. And it makes it tough to be human sometimes. So I, I'll just continue to try to inspire um, women and men to let's lift each other up in the workplace versus tear each other down. We'll get so much more done. <laughs> we'll accomplish so much more and we'll have fun doing it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And besides all of that, I, I think I would just say when we talk about allyship, women can be allies just as well as men or any other. And the first order of duty to ourselves is to be our own ally. And that means communicating what we're experiencing, what we're struggling with. Um, people can't be an ally to us if they don't know what we're thinking or what we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no benefit to just putting the armor on and assuming you just have to plow through it or get through a tough situation. And there's no one who will be a greater ally to you than yourself. Right. And that's what coaches are great at is partnering with all of you, um, helping you have these conversations that can be difficult and you might need to practice. Another tip I heard um, a couple years ago was um, ask for reverse mentors. So mm -hmm. rather than going up, I want a mentor at the top. I want a mentor in the executive team. Ask for a mentor that is younger by yes. age or younger in career than you or a few of them and create a little reverse mentor group to surround you with um, because it'll work both ways. It will help you get new, fresh ideas from a different perspective, but then it also helps you ally and bring up uh, women or younger leaders in the organization and, and be powerful for both of you. Agree with that for sure. All right. I've experienced it. <laughs> you have? Yes, I've had a younger mentor and it's been really powerful. Yeah. So, so what were your big takeaways? Yeah. I mean, you know, what I struggle with sometimes is just keeping up with the generational differences. And in my role, my previous role in it as a coach, I, I am really wanting to make sure I have the right insight to meet people where they're at. And so that's been very helpful for me to, in particular, understand a younger generation 
And I've actually encouraged um, Gen Y to now mentor Gen Z nice. as they're coming into the workplace. Uh, I think that's really important. And some of them, you know, graduated high school or college during the pandemic oh, yeah. and didn't get the training to really um, understand professionalism in the workplace. So all kinds of benefits from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning that because we could have as many as five generations. Yes. In workplace. Yes. In or at any one point in time. And if we want these gender biases to rinse away at some point, yeah. not go through the cat fight stuff that you and I have been through and get much better at this, it's mm -hmm. important to lean down and, and have that reverse mentoring in place. Correct. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Pam. I appreciate you being with me today. Thank you, too. Have a good one. Bye-bye.